Hello and welcome to Lightways at Life Astrologer with me, Anna Isabel, and my guest today, Henry Seltzer. Welcome, Henry. Uh, good to be here. Thank you. Well, it's lovely to have you back because last time you, we were talking about Eris, and um, I'm, <coughs> excuse me, and I know that we had unfinished business with two others that you were keen to talk about. So I thought today would be a good day to do exactly that. So I have um, a book called The Ephemeris of Trans-Neptunian KBO Planets. And so that talks about Eris, but it also talks about Hermea and Makimaki. So I think maybe it might be good to start with Humea um, from an astronomical perspective. Well, actually, the first thing I'd like to say about these is that I make a huge distinction, which many astrologers do not, between KBOs that are out there in the Kuiper belt that are actually officially named as planets by the astronomers versus the others which you can consider uh, candidates. You know, um, not everybody makes that distinction. I, I, I don't know why that came to me that way. I, I have a scientific background. And, um, you know, just to me, the, the evidence from the previous uh, centuries is that, uh, you know, the astronomers name something, they call it a planet, and they say, wow, here's a, here's a new planet in our, in our solar system. When Uranus was first discovered, people never thought, I mean, astrologers, astrologers never thought that they would be using it in charts. They were like, oh yeah, that's, there's some weird thing out there. You can't even see it, you know? And then same for Neptune, same for Pluto, which was also so tiny. So um, astrologer Rick Levine interviewed me recently also about these things. And he made the comment, I thought it was a very interesting comment. He said, you know, when Pluto was first discovered, the universal uh, reception of astrologers was, we're not gonna work with that. <laughs> You know, we, we've got our planets, you know, up till Neptune, we, we know what we're doing. And, uh, you know, it's so little, it's so far out there. But of course, Pluto came to be very important in charts. And I think these, now to me, the distinction is worth making that they're officially named as planets, even though dwarf, you know, planets. And I, I, I think uh, the same category as Pluto, of course. So uh, to me, that was the, the guiding light that here we have an astronomical object, Eris, same category uh, as far as the uh, astronomers were concerned as, as, as Pluto could be just as significant in charts. And then I had to extend that to how man Maki Maki. So that, that's just, I wanted to get that said because I, I know a lot of astrologers are looking at something like Orcus or um, Exion and there, there's others out there and may, they may be just as interesting. Sometimes astro astrologers call them dwarf planets but they're not actually dwarf planets by the nomenclature of the IAU. And I, I do think there's something about the official recognition. Uh, it's part of the culture. I mean, it's a very mysterious thing how these things come into our awareness as, uh, as part of the 21st century. But I think, I think there is a, diff a distinction to be made there. So that's why I <laughs> chose to concentrate on those three and uh, did that ephemeris book because Maria K. Sims actually at ACS uh, they did all the ephemeris books, you know, um, wanted to do this. She's, she's the one that commissioned that work. She said, uh, let's do it. And uh, we'll include Pluto. We'll include all the, the KBOs beyond Neptune that are officially named. So she had that same distinction in mind, I think. And we, we did do that book together. So I, I just had so many thoughts going through. Um, the first was thinking about uh, things that we use, which are not officially planets you know i thought about chiron yes. being you know the yeah, one that, yes very good point very good point um so i think i'm not sure where i stand on this i i feel that we need time to process what each has to bring i do think i do believe that something named is important because it reveals something of the consciousness. It means we've paid enough attention to actually give it a name. And if we're paying it enough attention to give it a name, then it means it's got a significance. So it, I think that that's, that's important. Um, the rest, I think I'll sit on the fence for a while longer. <laughs> it's a tough one. I mean, you know, who knows? These are, these are mysteries. I mean, uh, part of the general mystery of how astrology could work anyway. 
You know, it, it is something to do with the recognition. You know, in modern physics, they say the observer changes the outcome of the experiment depending on the observer, right? That's one of the things that are, is mysterious about the new physics. And so um, interestingly, um, it is when we have the cultural recognition of these objects as named planets. Uh, you make a very good point about Chiron. I would never do a chart without Chiron. Chiron is not officially a planet. Uh, it's officially a centaur is the, is the uh, uh, type of object. And, uh, you know, okay, <laughs> Chiron's a maverick <laughs> in many ways, but, you know, certainly, and, and then, then there's the other centaurs, which are, you know, like Pholus and um, Nessus are very important in charts. So, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I realized that probably I'll have to extend my research to some of these others at some point, but I did concentrate, <laughs> obviously, since the book is out now, on these, these four. Um, Pluto's well known, uh, Eris is becoming well known, and how man Maki Maki, it just seemed logically to me, would, would have to be important in charts since they are in that full on category of astronomers have called these a type of planet, <laughs> what I call KBO planets. I like the term KBO planets myself because it does describe exactly what they are. They're in the Kuiper belt. They're now Ceres is to me an asteroid still, as far as our work, the four feminine asteroids, I wouldn't want to break that up. So I know people are concentrating on Ceres a little bit more since it's been declared a dwarf planet by the astronomers and that makes sense. But of course we also understand Ceres pretty well. So I don't think our understanding astronomically I'm sorry, astrologically. I don't think our astrological understanding of Ceres has changed uh, with the naming. But um, these new ones, of course, they were completely unknown factors. So that was a big question mark to me. And you bring up, how did I imagine coming up with a meaning for Haumea and or Maki Maki? And, um, you know, uh, Haumea, it's very interesting in the mythology because she actually represents not only, okay, I, I thought that these two were the officially named ones of all of the uh, objects out there. And they were of course also named for indigenous gods and goddesses. We do not have them in the Roman, uh, the Greek or Roman uh, pantheon of gods and goddesses. So that struck me as important that these were the first officially named objects coming from rather than uh, classical uh, mythology coming from uh, indigenous peoples. And so I, I wanted to concentrate on that. And then if you look at the mythology of Haumea, the creation goddess of Hawaii, she represents nature in many ways. I mean, uh, she had a wand that could make food appear, which is just, uh, a, a, a just a, a, an attribute of the island. You know, everywhere you turn, yes, there's, there's food on the, on the trees and on the bushes and in the ground. Um, and so that not only that, she gave birth from many different parts of her body, from her womb, her breasts, her hips, and regenerated as a young woman again, became just like she was before. And I think that is also kind of a, a, an emblem for nature. So this is where I got the idea of nature. Well, I mean, you can't not think of her in, in nature, in my understanding of her. It, because everything about her is abundance. Everything is about generosity. Everything is about um, growth and, and life. It's almost as, as though she's the embodiment of the celebration of life um, in the way that I see her. So and when you say life, you mean life, including all life, including nature as the absolutely. web of life. And that's so important. I, I, I didn't mention, but to me, that's indigenous societies in general. In other words, when I was saying that thing about these are indigenous gods and goddesses, I was thinking also of the way the indigenous societies always re recognized that connection to, to the web of life and to the other creatures on the planet, to the processes of life itself, to uh, Gaia principle that even the whole planet is alive. So that's, yeah, that's where I was coming from, right? So I'm thinking there's something about the choice of naming this previously unknown dwarf planets that's been sitting there for a long time as Haumea, this amazingly beautiful symbol at a time when we've pretty much in the West lost touch with shamanic principles and, and the whole idea that everything is alive, that everything is animated. I think there's something here 
that perhaps is telling us that we're yearning to rediscover that. What do you think? I agree with you 100%, probably 110%. Yeah, it's quite exciting, isn't it? It is. And, you know, the shamanic planets are, do include also Eris to an extent. Um, I, I have a friend you might know of, Daniel Giamario, and he uh, has a thing called the Shamanic Astrology Mystery School, SAMS. And he uh, has led people to different uh, sacred sites to look at the night sky as an experiential form of astrology. So, you know, he's, he's very into the whole shamanic um, notion of, of going to depth within the psyche. And um, he had already Chiron and, and Pluto in his category as shamanic planets, both. And then, by the way, he added Eris after he discovered Eris through my work, and we had many discussions about Eris. And I, I was able to point out where it was in his chart, and he was able to respond to that by saying, oh my God, yes, you've nailed that completely. And so he was, or, you know, it's not me that nailed it completely, but it's, he recognized the archetype when I described it to him, let's put it that way. Anyway, uh, so he considers uh, Chiron, Pluto, and Eris to be shamanic planets. And he would probably be interested in including these other two, I think, if he got into it, perhaps. I don't know where he's at on that. I haven't discussed how I'm with him. But um, yeah, I think it's so amazing that, um, just when we have reached this particular point in the 21st century, as we are entering a new century. And, you know, interestingly, the previous dis discoveries of previous centuries came, you know, in the 1700s, the 18th century, the 19th century, and the 20th century was each one of those brought a new planetary object into Western astrology, which was then incorporated into the work of Western astrologers. And now we have these three coming in now. So I think it's fascinating. So if we come back to Humea, one of the things that I really also love about her is this idea of regeneration. But, you know, Pluto is about regeneration and that's no picnic. Exactly. What's the, what's the difference with this regeneration? Well, <clears throat> you know, um, when you said it was all sweetness and light, I was aware that there is such a thing as the shadow side of all these planetary objects that we find. And I, myself, in my research, have not really concentrated much on the shadow side. Um, I was giving this talk um, on, on the new ones on how me and Maki Maki at the AA conference in London last fall. And somebody asked a question at the end, what about the shadow side? <laughs> how come you're not talking about that? And I had to admit that I hadn't been focused on that. Um, I do think that that is partly a bias because it is such an important uh, thing for our times to recognize the connection to nature. And what I found that went along with that to, to speak on the plus side again first, just summarize, is that um, you know it's not only just that we love those people with prominent how may love nature. Um, they also and they find comfort in nature. Of course, everybody does find comfort in nature, I think to some extent. But um, it's also a recognition of something within us that's very important, a connection to perennial wisdom. Uh, I call it natural law. I call it right action, right relationship. Uh, that seems to be fundamental to this also. And there's also a certain charisma with these people, you know, that you just find them just very alive in a certain way. And I, I think that does lend itself, you know, that this uh, awareness of our connection to the natural world and to perennial wisdom and to sort of what's right, they, an, an innate moral compass, just gives a tremendous uh, amount of, uh, it's kind of a life fulfilling, you know, there's, there's a lot of life there. There's a lot of um, beautiful um, connection that, that just everybody senses, I think. And so you see, you see charisma is just a, a, ca a characteristic of these people by and large. Um, but to, to balance it by talking about the, the shadow side, I do see sometimes how Maya in the, um, in the new moon chart and that accompanied the lava outbursts and she was the mother of Pele. You know, the recent lava outbursts on the big island had by chance or not, uh, how Maya was, was prominent at that time and how Maya is prominent right now because at the very tail end, the very 29th degree of Libra where she 
station just recently um, that's been part of the, all the full moons have been, you know, the, the, um, the recent cancer full moon made a T-square to that point. So I was saying stuff like, well, we may see nature rising up, you know, uh, in protest at the, at the devastations that have been, you know, accelerating with this, with this culture that we have mm. now, which is pr probably also what you were referring to when you said this is a great time for the connection to nature to come into our consciousness, isn't it? I mean, like you say, the planets were out there, but until we recognize them, until we start to incorporate them into our vision and see what they might have to tell us, that's when they come into our, our awareness. So that's interesting. I, th I think there is something else there. Okay. I would be tempted to say that rather than looking at it as nature rising up against us, I would say that natural catastrophic events often are the focus for regeneration. Okay. Um, so I, I, I would leave us- Yeah, 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 that's, that's but, well said. I mean, I didn't, I didn't mean to indicate that there's some kind of a petty I'll get you back kind of thing. It's yeah. all a process. It's all a process, it, isn't it? it of is. evolution and, and spiritual evolution. So and we we pre, the I think that this is the key because our relationship with nature has been in one in which we often lose earthquakes, gales, you know, big storms, that kind of thing. I mean, we just had a big storm. I've just lost my shed. <laughs> Not my I know. We see that all over the place. I mean, the yeah. flooding. Uh, um, the going and on the, the fires in the west i mean it's pretty exactly bad. we feel we feel this sense of you know powerlessness in in the face of nature and we feel that either we've done something wrong we've always thought we've done something wrong and angered the gods and therefore here yeah. they come and strike us now yeah. because we think we're we're doing terrible things you know to, to the earth we think oh she's going to we're still at it we're still saying oh it's going to strike us um I'm not sure that this is the healthiest way to look at it because I don't, because nature is nature. And, you know, forest fires often, there are in South Africa, there are plants that need fire for the seeds to, to be able to, to, uh, to germinate. Um, I understand. And, you know, um, gardens that get decimated in gale winds often have the opportunity for something new to come from it. So I think we need to perhaps temper ourselves a little bit and understand that nature does have cycles, but that always I think the aim of nature is to regenerate. And maybe that is Humea. Well, that's a good point. Um, you know, I would go further and say that we have death in our human lives, and that death is often um, regarded in not a sacred way as it should be, but, or as it could be, <laughs> to avoid the word should. But, um, you know, similarly, what you said about the fire sometimes is exactly what's needed to create the next cycle. Similarly, death is a natural part of our existence, and we need not, we need not fear it. You know, I mean, I think, um, you know, when we have a fuller recognition of what life is about, we accept death as well. And that's maybe part of this spiritual evolution that we're all trying to achieve. You know, I think the culture is moving through, um, you know, people talk about how bad things are, but I think they've always been um, some terrible things. You know, there's been war and devastation. There's been slavery in past ages, not so much now. Now it's regarded universally as something to be avoided, to be recognized. Uh, to rectify. So I, I hear what you're saying. Um, maybe that was shorthand to say the earth is rising up against us for the, but you know, the other thing is we do have a world out of balance. You know, we are uh, cutting down too many trees in the Amazon for cattle, grain. Uh, we are um, doing various things that, that need to be, you know, including the carbon in the atmosphere. And it, it, it does need to, to find um, a recognition of Absolutely. The forces of nature that we're not, you know, and that's why I treated, find, treated and that's why I find the fact that we've chosen to name her, to to to, to name this new planet Humea. I think that's so exciting because I think there's a subconscious, if not a conscious, um, desire here 
to redress that balance. Yes, absolutely. If, if we look at human history, it seems to me that for the most part, certainly in terms of our own Western culture, that it's been about trying to survive nature and so much, you know, technological innovation is about, you know, keeping us safe and warm and, you know, in the face of nature. And I think I like the idea of instead of fearing nature, actually embracing her, cherishing her, working with her and, you know, allowing ourselves to understand her better, which comes right back to the more indigenous yes. um, view of nature. And you know that the indigenous societies were also about keeping safe and warm. Yes. With nature instead of uh, opposed to nature. Exactly. And I think that whole attitude, you know, uh, I like what Robert Hand calls the uh, 17th century phenomenon, the, the enlightenment. He says, let's call it what it is. Let's call it the endarkenment. Because this was when the lights went out as far as the recognition beyond rationality of the other side of life, which is not rational, which has to do with uh, recognizing the great chain of being they used to have. So I think we need to come into a new balance on these things. And astrology is a very helpful part of that, you know, that we can begin to recognize beyond where the Christian era took us to, you know, the God <laughs> that sits on his throne in the white beard, and you'll be lucky to get into his presence when you die. Um, I think that's that's kind of faded, you know, I mean, or, you know, not just talking about Christianity, of course, all the fundamentalist religions have um, in some ways exceeded their shelf life, uh, unfortunately, you know, and, and it's fine. I mean, it's, as you say, there's, um, you know, a process to everything, everything comes and goes and, and there's new regeneration. And I think we just have to aid in the regeneration that's fundamentally happening now. And you do see various souls that are on top of it as far as um, trying to come to a new sense of spirituality, trying to come to a new understanding of our connection to nature and how that is fundamental. And we need to, we need to just recognize that we're in a spiritual existence in spite of all the evidence to the contrary, in spite of, the, not the evidence, but in spite of the predilection of, of the previous cultures to, to try to be super rationalistic, super materialistic, and just ignore these fundamental, um, well, the perennial philosophy, you could say, which has just always been there, always, always part of every religion. So, you know, that, that, that's that is part of the how may have, yeah. That's a renewal in itself. It's a renewal of our own culture and our own understanding. And I quite like the ancient Egyptian way of new discovery, but we don't throw everything else out just because we've got a new discovery. We integrate the new discovery into our understanding. And we don't have to throw away much of all of our culture just to start afresh. We don't, but we can learn from our mistakes and we can incorporate new things and bring back things that we've lost as well and yes. i really like robert hans <laughs> assessment of the enlightenment it I took me a while to understand what he was talking about i i, I when i first heard that i was like what what is he saying <laughs> yeah no, now, I, now i get it a little bit better than i ever did yeah absolutely what is the um orbit of humea well the orbital period is uh 484 years, I like to use that. It changes every once in a while. People, you know, the astronomers get more accurate. I like that because Pluto is 248. <laughs> and then you have 284, and then Maki Maki is 309. So these two, the last two of these new uh, KBO planets are actually quite similar in their orbit, and they're not very different from Pluto. So uh, you have a phenomenon where you have... Um, for example, Haumea and, and Pluto were conjunct in 1954. And so then Pluto, being the faster of those, moved ahead. And so you see Pluto moving ahead, moving ahead, moving ahead. And you think it would just move ahead to it becomes the first square, the opening square, which is an interesting thing, which is happening right now that we're in the opening square of that conjunction. But um, at some point, Haumea starts to catch up and overtake Pluto because they are so similar in their orbits and their eccentric orbits. And, you know, the, the perihelion of the Pluto orbit is different. 
it's really almost right angles to the perihelion of the Haumea orbit. So Haumea has a point in her orbit when she's moving faster than Pluto is moving in Pluto's orbit. I'm sorry about that. Um, so interestingly, you know, it's not that simple to look at the uh, synodic uh, period between Haumea and Pluto for that reason. Mm. So tell us a little bit about Maki Maki then. Um, okay. Well, okay, uh, to me, it's similar in the uh, conception because the creation god of the Rapa Nui people, and what we know of the Rapa Nui, um, well, all indigenous societies have this fundamental connection to nature. It's just so powerful. And the way they would choose their leader, and it was their spiritual leader, it was the one that would have the big dreams that would help to guide the people what was happening, where they were going, would be a young champion would have to come back with the first egg of the season. So this is so similar to our whole concept of Easter, which we have in Western culture through Christian culture, um, also involving as we know we hide Easter eggs, right? Is involving also the idea of the springtime and the regeneration of the springtime. Um, interestingly, the island is called Easter Island <laughs> because it was discovered near Easter. And the reason that they, decided on Maki Maki is because the planet was discovered near Easter time and they first called it Easter Bunny as a nickname and then they had to find an actual name and they chose the creation god of Easter Island. So Easter comes in in various ways with this naming of Maki Maki as a planet out there and is also the creation god of the Rapa Nui people and then you look at that um, connection that they had to the first egg of the season and it just kind of makes a whole um, cycle connect. So tell us more about the stories around Maki Maki. Well, okay, so the, the, the full story and people sometimes, well, anyway, it doesn't matter what sometimes. Um, so a young champion would represent an elder. So there were various elders that were in competition to become the bird man, which would be what, what they called uh, their, their spiritual leader. And when the timing was right, because the first egg of the season would only come <laughs> in the spring, obviously, they would see the birds uh, on the neighboring rocky landmass. And so the young champion would be strong and uh, active, would have to swim the strait, get over there, find the egg, you know, they'd find the first egg and br bring it back. It was the first egg in the sense of the first egg to come back to the culture back to the people because um, they would tie it in their headdress, they would have to swim the strait again, they'd have to climb this huge cliff. So it was sort of a triathlon competition and there would be a big, a big deal about it, just like we have our Olympics, right? Or Greeks had their Olympics. It would be, you know, he made it, he's the one, he brought the egg, he's the guy. And so uh, he would be the champion for an elder which, who would then become the bird man, very prestigious obviously for the year until the next uh, cycle. In terms of individual charts, I know you've done a lot of work on and researching what it means for individuals. Let's jump back to Humaya and, and talk a little bit about what she tells us about an individual. Well, uh, there's one thing I wanna mention, which is that these planets are usually 30 degrees apart, roughly. And uh, in the 50s, especially, they were 30 degrees apart. And they, because they're very similar in their uh, orbital period, um, in this last couple hundred years, not, not looking back over, over huge stretches of time, but just in the last couple hundred years, um, Haumea leads Maki Maki by as little as 20 degrees or as much as 40 degrees. But in that realm of 30 degrees, you have Haumea leading and Maki Maki coming behind. Now, if you think about it, if there's a 30 degree separation between those two planets, they're both going to show up by most of the aspects. I mean, not according to septile, not according to a quintile, those would be individual between one or the other. But I did find so many times that I would find strong Haumea and I would find strong Maki Maki. And it was hard to separate them out. I did, I did find some differences, but I really do think of these as, and one is a feminine goddess and one is a masculine god. And they both have to do with this concept of the indigenous society uh, representing uh, the connection to nature. So I, I do feel that there's a similarity in the way they both seem to represent. I, I do find that Maki Maki is more um, 
the activist. Um, I found environmental activists almost invariably have a strong one. And there's a couple of really good example charts that showed me those kind of differences. But I, at one point I was kind of surprised how, how similar the, the meaning seems to be for both of these. And they have similar periods. So maybe the period of a planet has to do with its meaning, I'm not sure. I mean, also Pluto is similar. And one, one thing we can say about all of these is they do go to depth within the psyche. You know, Pluto is known for that. Pluto, in, in its more established sense of the archetype, uh, Jeff Green did a lot of fantastic work there. And, and, and people do recognize Pluto as kind of a representation of the soul or maybe what's deep with, deepest within us. And I came to the conclusion that all these objects that are so far out, the farthest out, may correspond to the deepest within in terms of psychological astrology. So that was a big factor in the way I saw these, that um, they whatever, whatever that connection to nature represents, it's something quite deep within us, which makes some sense to me. I mean, you could also think of it almost as how fundamental it is, our human, the fact that we have bodies, <laughs> you know? I mean, we do come from, um, single-celled animals, you know, that combined and figured out ways to join up and become the multi-celled organisms, which then became more complex, which then became eventually humans. So, I mean, in a way it does, it refers to something, and Jung talked about that, you know, the depths of things. He talked about, you know, you had a, an unconscious that was personal and then a more collective unconscious that was deeper than that. So, I mean, talking about just what, what we're based on, what's, what is the human? You know, what are we, what are we? And uh, I mean, just to recognize that we do have this fundamental connection to nature, I think is very powerful and very profound as we've been talking. And so I see both of those as having aspects of it, both Haumea and Maki Maki. And then I think you were saying, what do I notice when I find a strong Haumea? One thing um, I, I, I first noticed, um, just connection to nature in terms of, I looked at charts like Thoreau, I looked at uh, John Muir, um, people that were really fundamental in the, the idea of their connection to nature and I found what I was looking for. In fact, with Haumea, it's very interesting um, in terms of the fact that there was a moment in John Muir's life when he abandoned being a foreman. He was very mechanically inclined, uh, very good with his hands and very smart and figured things out. And he applied that in terms of, he was, as a young man, he was employed in a factory that was making uh, broom handles and, and rake handles and things like that. It was just, just a factory he was where he was making a living. You know, he had some education, but he wasn't the naturalist that he became. But he had an event that happened to him, which um, he was trying to take apart um, a belt that was sewn together in the olden days. You know, this was in the 1800s, 1830s, I think. I'm not so good on the dates without looking, but <laughs> anyway, um, he was trying to pry the, the knot out with, his, with a file, the end of a file. And as he was prying and, and pulling up and pulling up to try to get the, the belt to, un, you know, trying to get the, the sewing, to, he plunged the blade of this file into his eye. It flip, flip, slipped off the belt and he, by the motion of his hand. Well, um, he lost the sight in both eyes. There was a sympathetic blindness in the other eye and he was told to stay in the dark. He stayed in the dark for six weeks and he was told that he might never see again, but you know, he hoped he would see again. Well, when his vision was restored, both eyes, he felt um, such a gratitude that he, and of course he wasn't working at that job anymore, um, he, he resolved to, to spend the rest of his life wandering through nature and um, became a botanist, you know, classified new, new, uh, new types of plants. He made his famous thousand mile walk, which he did, uh, which took him to Florida and then eventually to Cuba and then eventually uh, by boat to San Francisco and um, went to Yosemite Valley right away. And that he became what he became. Well, um, what, you, what you find in the date of that incident, that factory accident where he lost his sight, is you find a partile conjunction between transiting Haumea and his natal sun, and also the sun in the sky that day was contributing. So there's 
you know, it was current and, and the fact that there were some other su supporting aspects, I think it was Venus and the sun and, 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 that, and that transit. So I thought that was kind of iconic, you know, that uh, it brought him to nature, you see. Mm -hmm. um, before then he wasn't uh, doing what he eventually came, came to do. So in, in a way it refers to also uh, finding his life path, you know, finding his purpose. So, um, and I, I do find that, uh, you know, I looked at all those people and I found strong how may and that many times I've seen somebody and I've said, oh, they have a certain moral compass, like an example, a recent example was Liz um, Cheney. Here she is, you know, not exactly my politics, but here she is standing up for truth. She's saying, let's, let's talk truth here. Let's not screw around with uh, false, uh, uh, dialogues, false uh, things. You know, let's let's not have a political agenda that that tells lies. Let's go for the truth. And sure enough, she has a pretty strong Halme in her chart. So I thought that was very. All those were very interesting examples. That you know, I found that it wasn't just uh, tree huggers. You know, it was actually people that had a, a pretty strong moral compass. Um, I could see it in in the sense of that. You know, in other words, if I find somebody that oh, look at this person really respect, really admire them, really stands up for truth, they have it. <laughs> Another one was Alexander Vindman. Um, I just realized um, recently that, uh, that, you know, he wrote a book, uh, Right Matters, something like that, being right, being, being you know, here he comes up, risks his career, in fact, he got fired, uh, telling the truth about what was happening, uh, as he saw it during the uh, whole ploy to, uh, to get uh, dirt on Biden by, uh, having the Ukrainians announce an investigation into uh, Hunter Biden or something and uh, coerced by the former president as, as we all know. Um, and, there, and there he was, a very good example of strong, how may I don't remember the details of his chart right now. But anyway, so yeah, I, I do find it not only, another one was uh, by the way, David Bowie. David Bowie, it was the other way around. I found it in his chart first and I was wondering about that because you know, whereas, you know, he would go off into the mountains with his friends and be on his computer. They couldn't get him out of the cabin. So, you know, he's not somebody that was like reveling in waterfalls and, and jungle scenery situations, but yet on the other hand, um, there's something fundamental about the way he almost produced new, um, new worlds. You know, there was, he, he, he was creating new worlds within the culture by, by his style and by his music that maybe connected us to these fundamentals in more, more ways than, than you, you know. He, he didn't take the path of, I'm gonna go into nature and just be in nature, but he was, he was nature in a certain way he represented nature. The quote from him is, um, he said, people call me a chameleon. I think I'm just the opposite, is what he said. You know, a chameleon, rep, you know, blends with his environment. I did never did that. I always, yes, I was part of a, a culture and an environment, but it was what I created. That I, I think certainly with David Bowie, um, where that idea of Hermea creating out of everything, you know, he certainly had that force for creativity. Yes. Um, well, that that I can I can see that very very clearly. So if people want to learn more about these wonderful new additions to um, our astrological pantheon, um, the book that we've been discussing is The Ephemeris of Trans-Neptunian KBO Planets. And if they wanted to learn more about your work and you, Henry, how could they do that? Well, I do have a website and I sell the Time Passages software at that website. <clears throat> and that was what, something I created back in 95 and we've been working on it ever since. We have a little company and we do a pretty nice job of maintaining the software on multiple platforms. You know, it's on both the mobile platforms as well as Windows and Mac. And, um, and it's called astrograph.com. So I just, that's my website. I don't have a personal website for my work. Other than that, there's a resources tab and you can, you know, get a reading or whatever, but you know, a lot of what I've uh, articulated about these planets is in the software. I did manage to write uh, interpretations for natal, for Haumea and Makimaki by house and by connection to other planets. 
So those interpretations based on this new understanding that I've been able to come to and put in the book, uh, the first book, um, I'm writing a more extensive book about them as well. But uh, that's coming along. That's not close yet. <laughs> but, uh, well, I will uh, just have to wait. <laughs> I will. I will have, have more to say. Anyway, this is the book. Should I bring, show it? Uh, yes. This is the book. Um, yeah. And it's it's an ephemeris book, so it's got all the <laughs> calculations as it, well as the introduction. I've, the introduction I've, I've is a summary it. of what we've been talking about. I'm sorry. Yeah, I have. I've been enjoying it very much. And uh, I shall be putting a link to that and your website on the description box. Henry, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for, thanks for the conversation. Very good conversation. Appreciate it. And thank you all for watching. Um, next time, we're going to be looking at the dance of Venus and Mars. Um, until then, if you have any questions or if you also want to be in touch about talks and workshops that I might be doing, um, do feel free to contact me. Till next time, goodbye. <laughs>